In this video, we'll walk through cellular anatomy, talking about each organelle inside of the cell, what it does, and what types of diseases you can expect to see on your exam if there's a problem with that organelle. To be clear, here's the list that I'm talking about. We'll talk about plasma membranes, nucleus, nuclear envelope, chromatin, nucleolus, the smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, peroxisome, mitochondria, and lysosome. Let's begin with plasma membranes. So the function of the plasma membrane is that it serves as a phospholipid bilayer to shield the cell from the extracellular compartment. In the plasma membrane, you have various structures, and I've illustrated them in different colors here for your studying pleasure. In red, we see integral membrane proteins. These are things that are responsible for signaling and trafficking. In blue, we see cholesterol. Cholesterol is embedded throughout the plasma membrane, and it serves as a stabilizing force to further reinforce those lipid tails. In green, we see peripheral membrane proteins. These are various things, such as glycoproteins or phospholipase. They can be outward facing on the extracellular side, or they can be inward facing on the intracellular side, and they serve a purpose of identification. Here are some examples of those various elements. Again, in red, we see things like the sodium potassium ATPase. In blue, cholesterol stabilizing our membrane. In green, glycoproteins facing on the extracellular side, which serve a identification purpose. And phospholipase C facing the internal side, which are involved in enzymatic reactions and signaling cascades. So the plasma membrane has various elements embedded within it, and they all serve different roles. Now, as far as the actual composition of the membrane, it is composed of hydrophilic or water-loving heads, shown in red, and hydrophobic or water-fearing tails, shown in blue. And those hydrophilic heads are polar, and they are composed of phosphate and sphingosine. So their composition helps explain their characteristics. So the fact that it's phosphate and sphingosine, or in other words, the fact that it's negatively charged, makes the head polar, which makes it more permeable to nonpolar molecules and less permeable to polar molecules. The interior being composed of fatty acids helps explain why the interior of the plasma membrane is hydrophobic because it's not composed of a negatively charged polar molecule such as phosphate or sphingosine. It is composed of fatty acids. Now the fact that it's composed of fatty acids can help us understand membrane fluidity. So fatty acids can be either saturated, as you see up top here shown in blue, or unsaturated, as you see on the bottom shown in red. And if we zoom in with a mega microscope, really the only difference here is that unsaturated fatty acids feature a double bond. And that double bond creates a very small kink in the membrane. And so if I superimpose an image of what the lipid bilayer might look like if it was saturated in blue versus unsaturated in red, those double bonds create kinks. And those kinks create membrane fluidity. Membrane fluidity is very important for the plasma membrane. The more unsaturated fatty acids that you have, i.e. the more double bonds and the more kinks and the more membrane fluidity that you have, the better the membrane can function. So unsaturated fatty acids are better for the plasma membrane than saturated fatty acids. So that's a very important point to keep in your mind. Now let's talk about the nucleus. The nucleus is really the control center of the cell. It's where DNA replication occurs, transcription, and rRNA synthesis. In the nucleus, we have a couple important components. We have the nuclear envelope, which is that outer membrane on which ribosomes sit. So if you look at the image to the right, you can see on that outer nuclear envelope, you see little bumps. Those are just ribosomes. We also have nuclear pores, which I've shown in my image in red. Nuclear pores are small areas of trafficking, which allows the nucleus to communicate with the rest of the cell. And then on the interior surface, we have that inner membrane for support and stability. And those are the nuclear lamins. Those are very, very important for stability and for support. Now, as far as the nuclear pores go, it allows both large and small molecules into the nucleus, large molecules via active transport and small molecules via passive diffusion. For the purposes of your exam, the nuclear lamin is actually very important because if you have a lamin deficiency, 
for example, there's a type of lamin called lamin A, you can get different disease processes. And a lamin A deficiency specifically is responsible for Hutchinson Guilford progeria syndrome. And what you see here is a decrease or deficiency in lamin A, and that causes an increase in something called progerin. Some people just refer to this as progeria. You may have seen this before, so feel free to Google to see what this looks like. But Hutchinson Guilford progeria syndrome is the result of a problem or a deficiency in nuclear lamin, in this case, lamin A specifically. The other important thing to talk about with the nucleus is chromatin. Chromatin is composed of DNA, histones, and other supportive proteins. More specifically, DNA, which I've depicted in my image here as that red area with, with negatively charged phosphate molecules, is attracted to blue histones. And I've shown the blue histones with that blue diamond. Now, the reason you get an attraction here is because DNA has negatively charged phosphates and histones has positively charged arginine and lysine residues on it. And they are attracted to one another, positive P and negative A and L. So arginine and lysine to the phosphates. And so the combination or the grouping of the DNA with the histones and some other supportive proteins, which for the purposes of exams really are not important, that's referred to as a nucleosome. Now, this nucleosome uh, and the histone more specifically can undergo changes to make transcription happen more or less. And so if the histone becomes what's known as methylated, you get decreasing levels of transcription. If the histones become what's called acetylated, you get increased levels of transcription. So just to be clear here, methylation makes it mute, acetylation makes it active. Just remember M, methylation for mute, and A, acetylation for active. Methylation equals decreased transcription, acetylation equals increased transcription. And now depending on whether the histones are methylated or acetylated, chromatin is referred to either heterochromatin or euchromatin. And I'll show you what this looks like under a microscope because it's important to know for your exam. But heterochromatin means that you have a state of decreased transcription. So the histones are more condensed and they appear darker. In euchromatin, you have increased levels of transcription. So we've got histones that appear less condensed and brighter because more cellular activity is happening. So they're less condensed. So again, here we go. Heterochromatin is decreased transcription. So more methylation. Euchromatin is increased transcription. So more acetylation. And what you should know for your exam is what that looks like under a microscope. So I, I've shown two examples here. Heterochromatin is that darker condensed structure. It's darker because it's all packaged and squeezed in together because there's no transcription happening. It's just packaged and it's awaiting further instruction. That's heterochromatin. And again, you would see this if the histones were methylated. Remember M methylated equals mute. Euchromatin by comparison appears much lighter because it's relaxed. Transcription is actually happening. So that complex of chromatin and histones, etc., that needs to open up. It needs to relax because things are actually happening. So in the case of euchromatin, your histones are probably going to be acetylated. Remember, A, acetylation equals active. So know the difference between hetero and euchromatin. Know the difference between methylation and acetylation. This is very high yield. Last point to talk about with the nucleus is that within the nucleus, we have something called a nucleolus. So this is actually the center of the center. Think, you know, it's kind of funny. The nucleus is the center and the command center of the cell. And then the nucleus has its own little command center in the center of its center. And that's the nucleolus. In the nucleolus, we have rRNA synthesis and ribosomal assembly. So nucleolus, just remember the letter R for rRNA and ribosomes. That's really all you need to know. Not a whole lot of complexity here. Let's move on and talk about the endoplasmic reticulum. There are two different types of endoplasmic reticulums. There's the smooth ER and the rough ER. Let's go through them one at a time. The smooth ER is responsible for steroid synthesis, carbohydrate metabolism, and detoxing various substances. The smooth ER is referred to as the smooth ER because it has no surface ribosome. So when you look at what it appears like, it's actually smooth. There's no bumpy little ribosomes on the surface. And here's what we see. So this is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Again, no ribosome, so it appears very smooth. For the smooth ER, I want you to remember the letter S, S for smooth. 
S for steroids, sugar, and substances. For steroid synthesis, carbohydrate metabolism, and detoxing substances. These are abundant in the hepatocytes and just change the letter C to S in hepatocytes to remember this. So smooth ER, remember the letter S. Steroids, sugar, substances found in the hepatocytes. Now let's compare that to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The rough ER is responsible for secretory, lysosomal, and membrane protein synthesis. It does something called N-linked oligosaccharide tagging of proteins. And yes, it does have surface ribosomes. And that's the reason that this is the rough endoplasmic reticulum. If you look at an image of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, you see that it looks bumpy. It has this rough surface to it. And that is because just like we saw on the outside of the nucleus, we have ribosomes sitting there on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So it gives it a rough and bumpy appearance and that makes it very distinct from that darker orange slash brown thing you see next to it, which is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Something that's really important to know for exams, and I don't know why it's so important, but for whatever reason, test writers like it, is you should know that in the neuron, the rough endoplasmic reticulum is called the Nissel body. So if you see Nissel body, your brain should think rough endoplasmic reticulum in a neuron. It's a high yield fact, just memorize it. But that's really all you need to know for the rough endoplasmic reticulum. For smooth and rough here, not a whole lot to know, really not as high yield as other organelles in the cell. So let's move on and talk about the Golgi apparatus. So the Golgi apparatus is responsible for distribution and modification specifically for glycoproteins and lipids. It synthesizes lysosomes and it fills them up with enzymes. And then the Golgi will communicate with those lysosomes. And so all of this is pretty much linked. It's also responsible for an element of endocytosis. So it recycles plasma membrane proteins. By and large, the most important thing to know about the Golgi apparatus is modification. So it modifies different residues and essentially tags things so that all of the organelles can function together. So here are some examples of modifications done by the Golgi apparatus, and these could show up on your exam, so I would know this. First thing we see is O-linked glycosylation. So O-oligosaccharides can be tagged on serine or threonine residues. The next thing we can see is modification of N oligosaccharides. So asparagine molecules get, get modified, and this is referred to as modification of N oligosaccharides. And lastly, and probably most importantly, we can see phosphorylation of mannose residues. So mannose residues will be phosphorylated to mannose 6-phosphate. So before I go any further, let's pause for a second and just recap here. On your exam, you could be asked a question about modification of glycoproteins and lipids done by the Golgi. And so what you want to know, what you want to take away from this slide is that the Golgi can do three main things. One, it can glycosylate threonine residues or serine residues, and that's called O-linked glycosylation. Two, it can modify N oligosaccharides. So it can modify asparagine residues. And sometimes this is referred to as modification. Other times this is referred more broadly uh, to as modification of N oligosaccharides. And lastly, and again, I think most importantly, the Golgi can modify mannose residues by phosphorylation. So it will put a phosphate on the mannose and then you have mannose 6-phosphate. Now this last one shown in purple is really important because if this isn't functioning correctly, you get something called eye cell disease. And this does show up on exam, so understand the pathophysiology here. Under normal circumstances, again, the mannose residues will be phosphorylated and you'll get mannose 6-phosphate. This will then be packaged by the Golgi apparatus into lysosomes and those lysosomes will go on to carry out their very important lysosomal functions. However, if you don't do this correctly and there's no phosphorylation of the mannose residues, instead of these polymers being packaged into lysosomes, you now have something incorrect sitting in the Golgi or between the Golgi and the lysosome. And so what will happen here is that instead of packaging it for the lysosome, it will be excreted extracellularly. And now we have extracellular material that doesn't work correctly. What we see here are various symptoms. So people with eye cell disease will have coarse facial features, corneal clouding, restricted joint movement, and organomegaly. So these are all symptoms of eye cell disease, which again is due to the failure of the phosphorylation of mannose residues. So very, very high yield.
Now let's move on to talk about peroxisomes. Peroxisomes are extremely important and their diseases show up all the time on exams. Peroxisomes are responsible for the catabolism of fatty acids and more specifically branched chain fatty acids as well as ethanol and amino acids. They synthesize something called plasmalogens and I'll talk more about why that's important in a few slides. They also synthesize steroid hormones and bile acids. So the first thing to point out is that peroxisomes are responsible for the catabolism of branched chain fatty acids. And as far as fatty acid oxidation goes, you should recall from the biochemistry section that you can do alpha oxidation and break down branch chain fatty acids, but you can also do beta oxidation and break down very large chain fatty acids. And what we'll see here is that the inability of the peroxisome to do alpha or beta oxidation will manifest as increased levels of either branch chain or very large chain fatty acids, and we'll see that in various diseases. The other thing that the peroxisome does is hydrogen peroxide metabolism. So hydrogen peroxide will be broken down into water plus oxygen. And recall that this is extremely important in terms of protecting against reactive oxygen species. Importantly, as I kind of touched on before, we have the synthesis of something called plasmalogens. And so plasmalogens are basically just phospholipids that are found in myelin and cardiac myocytes. So if we have a problem with the peroxisome and we therefore don't have the ability to synthesize plasmalogens correctly, we lose a very key component of myelin and cardiac myocytes. Therefore, if I tell you that you have a peroxisomal disease, you should expect to see mostly neurological, but also some cardiac symptoms as well, because again, we're losing a key component in myelin and myocytes. So now let's go through some of the peroxisomal diseases. The first that you need to know is Zellweger syndrome. So in Zellweger syndrome, we have an autosomal recessive mutation in the genes that code for peroxisome assembly. So the peroxisome is never assembled correctly, and therefore it can't carry out some of its key functions. Now, if you were paying attention to what I was talking about one slide prior, the actual pathophysiology here should make perfect sense. You get increased levels of branch chain fatty acids and very large chain fatty acids. Again, because the peroxisome was not assembled correctly, it can't carry out its beta oxidation and alpha oxidation. So you get increased levels of these fatty acids simply because they're never degraded. You also get decreased levels of plasmalogen, again, because the peroxisome has to synthesize plasmalogen. When we don't put the peroxisome together appropriately, we can never synthesize this. So you get your increased levels of things that aren't broken down and decreased levels of things that are never made. As far as symptoms go, what you'll see in Zellweger syndrome is impaired CNS formation, neonatal seizures, hearing loss, organomegaly, polycystic kidney disease, and hypotonia. The symptoms, admittedly are not as important to know as the pathophysiology, so I would know what's shown in red and blue, but keep these in the back pocket just in case. Now let's move on to refsum disease. And to be clear, because these are all peroxisome diseases, they will have some overlap, they will be similar. In refsum disease, we have an autosomal recessive mutation, which impairs alpha oxidation specifically. So because it's specifically alpha oxidation that gets impaired, it's just the branch chain fatty acids that can't be catabolized. So we get increased levels of branch chain fatty acids, specifically increased levels of phytanic acid. And we see decreased levels of phytanyl-CoA hydroxylase or peroxin-7. In refsum disease, the symptoms you want to look out for are sensory neural hearing loss, ataxia, cataracts, a short fourth toe, which is really, really high yield. I don't know why, but they love the short fourth toe. So that's the one you want to memorize if you're going to pick one and blindness. Lastly, let's talk about adrenoleukodystrophy. This is an X-linked mutation, which impairs beta oxidation of very long chain fatty acids. So a couple important things here. In adrenoleukodystrophy, you want to memorize X-linked because that's unique compared to the other ones and you wanna know that it's very long chain fatty acids. So we're specifically talking about beta oxidation here. Because of this, we see increased levels of very long chain fatty acids, more specifically, serotic acid. And this is due to decreased ABCD1 gene. And that's the gene that codes for the ALD membrane transporter protein. The symptoms in adre adrenal leukodystrophy that you wanna think about are neuropsychiatric symptoms. So just behavioral problems, things like that adrenal insufficiency, and sexual dysfunction. So the thing to take away from adrenal leukodystrophy is what makes it unique. 
So I would memorize that it's X-linked and that it's beta oxidation specifically. You could then take that one step further and say, well, if it's beta oxidation, that means I see increased levels of very long chain fatty acids, specifically serotic acid. So those are your different peroxisome diseases. Again, the summary, if you want to keep things simple, is that if you can't do beta oxidation or alpha oxidation, what's increased will be your fatty acids and what will be decreased will be your plasmalogens. Okay, so those are peroxisomes. Now let's talk about the mitochondria. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. It's referred to the powerhouse because it generates ATP, specifically through oxidative phosphorylation. So we're talking about the electron transport chain. The mitochondria has very, very important biochemical functions. These functions occur in the matrix, but also in the inner membrane. The matrix has most of them, so you'll see the citric acid cycle, urea cycle, ketogenesis, beta oxidation, pyruvate decarboxylation, gluconeogenesis, heme synthesis, and acetyl-CoA synthesis. Don't forget that in the inner membrane, you have oxidative phosphorylation. I have videos literally on all of these different biochemical pathways in the biochemistry section of my channel. So make sure you check that out if you're not feeling great about biochemistry because I simplify everything for you. And then the other thing to know about the mitochondria is that on the outer membrane, you have something called porins. These are a selective barrier that only lets certain things into the mitochondria because you have to be very selective about what gets in because of how important the mitochondria is. Now, what's really high yield for exams is mitochondrial DNA. You might see this written as mtDNA. That just means mitochondrial. This refers to circular DNA that's found inside of the mitochondria. So mitochondria as an organelle are very unique because they have their own DNA. And this DNA is really high yield for exams because it it goes through maternal inheritance patterns. Test writers absolutely love to ask this question, so pay really special attention to how this works. So the reason that mitochondrial DNA exhibits maternal inheritance is that there is paternal mitochondrial DNA, but that's only located, for whatever reason, in the tail of the sperm. And during fertilization, you don't get any of the genetic components of the tail of the sperm because that part is lost during fertilization. So really the only thing that's zygotically inherited post fertilization comes from mom. So it's coming in that maternal mitochondrial DNA. So the reason that this is really high yield on exams is that test writers could show you a pedigree that will look something like this. And then they'll ask you which of the following diseases does the patient have? And what they'll be asking you is essentially, can you recognize that this is maternal inheritance? And therefore, can you take that one step further and pick the answer that's a mitochondrial uh, DNA related disease? And so in your pedigree, what you wanna look for is that if it's an affected male, none of the offspring will get the disease. Again, because paternal mitochondria doesn't get passed on, it's lost through the tail of the sperm during fertilization. But if it's an affected female, she will pass it to all of her offspring because, again, the only mitochondrial DNA is zygotically inherited from the mother's egg. So look at this pedigree here. Circles are females and squares are males. Affected circles or affected females give it to everybody. But affected males or affected squares give it to nobody. So if you see this on your exam, your brain needs to shoot off fireworks and say, okay, mitochondrial DNA, so now I'm looking for mitochondrial DNA related diseases. So let's talk about a few of those now. The two big ones are MRF and MELAS. MRF stands for myoclonus epilepsy with ragged red fibers, and MELAS stands for mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes. Now these are long names, I know that sucks, but the good thing is that the name tells you exactly what you see in the disease. So in MRF, you see myoclonus, epilepsy, and under microscopes, you'll see ragged red fibers. And I'll show you an image of what that looks like. In MELAS, you'll see encephalomyopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes. So if you want to spend the time memorizing the name, it will tell you what symptoms you will see. What I want to point out before we move any further is that because it's a mitochondrial disease, the mitochondria doesn't form correctly, right? There's some problem with mitochondrial DNA, and that is to say there's some problem with the mitochondria. So if you can't be the powerhouse of the cell that you're supposed to be, 
the organs that will be most affected are going to are going to be your most metabolically active organs. So in both of these diseases, we see problems with the brain and we see problems with the musculoskeletal symptom, right? More specifically, the muscles. The brain and muscles use up exceptional amounts of ATP. So because your mitochondria isn't working correctly, you don't make ATP like you should, all of your symptoms, or I should say most of your symptoms, are going to be in those metabolically active organs. Now, between these two diseases, the most high yield one is MRF. And the reason it's most high yield is because the test writer is going to show you a picture of a ragged red fiber, which looks like this. So these are ragged red fibers. You might see them described instead of written out as ragged red fibers. So the other way that I would suggest learning this is if you see the phrasing accumulated dysfunctional mitochondria in the subsarcolemma, that is a very fancy technical way of saying ragged red fiber. So takeaway here is if you see this image, it's MRF. And if you see this image, it's a mitochondrial disease. So it's going to be maternally inherited. So as you can see here, the test writer can incorporate all of these things into third order questions and write a pretty good test question. So I would definitely understand how this works. Last thing we're going to talk about is lysosomes. So lysosomes digest intracellular polymers via enzymatic reactions. They can do this via phosphatases, nucleases, endoproteases, lipases, or glycosidases. Doesn't matter which, all of these different enzymatic reactions will digest intracellular polymers. So how this works is first we have something called a primary lysosome that is formed by endocytosis. So the cell membrane will pinch off and form a primary lysosome. That primary lysosome will then travel next to the Golgi and it will get lytic enzymes from the Golgi. So those lytic enzymes will bud off from the Golgi and essentially merge with that primary lysosome. Once it merges, primary lysosome plus Golgi lytic enzymes, now it's referred to as a secondary lysosome. That secondary lysosome has those hydrolytic enzymes inside of it, and that will degrade whatever polymer the lysosome is targeting. Once the polymer is degraded, you have what's known as cleavage products, and those can either be one dumped into the cytosol in where they'll be recycled, or they can remain as what's called residual bodies. And those are just undigested lipid material that kind of hang around. But this is how lysosomes work. So know that you have a primary lysosome. It merges with something from the Golgi to become a secondary lysosome. It will then degrade the polymer using the lytic enzymes from the Golgi. And then you can either recycle or keep it as a residual body. So that's how lysosomes work. Now that's it for this video. Just to summarize, here's what we talked about today. Plasma membranes, nucleus, nuclear envelope, chromatin, nucleolus, smooth ER, rough ER, Golgi, peroxisome, mitochondria, and lysosome. And as I went through this, I pointed out all of the diseases that you want to keep your eye out for on exams. So I hope this wasn't too overwhelming. It was a longer video than I usually make, but this is a very extensive topic. Good luck.